Housing magazine, and um, great to be here. I think a, a fascinating initial um, couple of sessions. So uh, I've certainly got a, a notebook full of ideas just from from those. Um, this session, as Philip said, is on innovation and regulation in social housing. Um, probably quite appropriate given the session we just had talking about you know, trying to push housing associations, social landlords to try to uh, realise uh, their potential. I think that uh, we'll, we'll hear from Matthew and obviously from others on the panel about um, just how you ensure that that is done in a, in a way that doesn't kind of, um, you know, endanger organisations and, and, and manages the risks of, uh, associated with that. So um, I think that um, you know, we've, got, we've got a good opportunity here to to get into this the social bar idea as a, as a journalist i was obviously quite keen to see a social bar talked about i think uh, there's no alcohol as far as i can see yet which is a bit disappointing but you know i live in, I live in hope for lunchtime and um, a panel today we've got elizabeth osterberry who's the chief executive of moat in kent and um, we've got uh, victoria jardin who's a partner anthony collins solicitors and uh, matthew bales who's the director of regulation at the homes and communities agency and Sean Bailey, who's been abandoned over here, actually. Um, uh, no, I think due to, due to the light, I think, dazzling everybody else, I think yeah. Sean's just able to avoid it. But Sean Bailey's um, a member of the Government Community and Youth Engagement uh, uh, Panel. He's an advisor to the Cabinet Office. Um, as I say, it's a great time for this session. Um, most of you will be aware, but just for those of you who are not, uh, Matthew and his colleagues at the HCA uh, have just begun to, to set out their, their thinking and the steps they think that uh, they need to take to, to, um, to innovate in the regulation of registered providers um, uh, of, of social homes in England. And uh, it's probably fair to say, Matthew, that I think um, you know, some proposals have been welcomed, like in wills, the idea of trying to ensure that um, uh, you know, properties are not put at risk, undue risk, by, uh, by activities uh, social landlords might look to undertake. Um, but I think uh, others have been less popular. Um, I think the general proposal on ring fencing has got people sort of quite exercised, it's fair to say. So I'm sure we hear a bit about that from, from Matthew. Um, I think that you know, there is a concern expressed by many in the housing sector too that you know, we came very close, as many of you will know, over the course of the last year or so to um, you know, having the, the first you know, large housing association go bust. Uh, cosmopolitan housing group uh, in the northwest um, that was averted pretty much at the last minute um, by, by a merger with sanctuary but i think um, you know, the hc's regulators i think rightly would say that well you know we can't be the ones that are left um, sitting in our hands if somebody does actually go, go go under because of poor management we can't be able to you seem to allow that to happen. So there's a, there's a good debate to be had here. Um, and then obviously the housing associations themselves. Um, uh, you know, we've heard a lot today in the challenges and the opportunities that, uh, and the possibilities that, that face them in, in terms of uh, building stronger communities. Um, the Res Publica itself has done a lot of work in recent years in trying to kind of you know, explore what those possibilities might be. Um, but you know, there is a key question really about the extent to which housing associations have the appetite, have the skills, uh, to, to, to really to, to, to innovate and you know as I think Indy was getting at uh, as well you know the extent to which associations are able to, to do it well I think that's a really crucial point um, so you know and are people nimble enough to, to access the resources to deliver that innovation so yeah so tons to get stuck into um, I'm assuming Philip are, are we kind of pushing beyond one o'clock in this session I think we're going to finish as close to it as we can so we could, okay so, so if, very you keep, if you keep the speakers to a yes. short Pithy presentation. We'll also turn this off so people aren't blinded. Might be so we'll catch all the tweets as well. Okay, so fine. So the speakers are going to be uh, are going to be concise anyway. Seven minutes each. But if you're able to squeeze it even more, that would be good. So we get time for uh, for discussions before lunch. I'm conscious that people are probably getting pretty parched out there, so I don't want people to be feeling as though they're going to collapse. So let's try and uh, uh, you know we'll, we'll get to lunch as soon as we can. Don't worry. Um, okay, fine. Uh, our first speaker is Elizabeth. a vote of sympathy for Matthew, because personally I would hate to be designing a fit-for-purpose system of regulation for affordable housing providers in the present environment. And I say that because of five principal considerations. 
Firstly, to begin with, the traditional housing association population is incredibly diverse in terms of history, size, capacity, risk appetite, product diversity and experience, not to mention geographic spread. So one size fits all regulation is always going to be a problem. Also, there's a dichotomy between the rhetoric that we quite often hear about housing associations have, or the sector generally, has latent capacity and needs to sweat its assets. And on the other hand, a regulatory system which is designed at the moment to prevent mistakes rather than enable expansion and development. Thirdly, the resources of most housing associations are increasingly being used to plug gaps left through changes to welfare system, either through shoring up the rent line or providing effective support to residents, both financially and on a wider basis. We also have a number of new entrants in the sector who are not for profit. So how do they fit into this picture? To what extent should they be policed in the same way? And do they share a common set of aims with the rest of the sector? So how do we deal with that differential set of drivers? And finally, the effective reductions in both capital and revenue subsidy that I know people have been talking about already mean that providers will already look to increasingly diversify their activities, probably the private rented sector being the most obvious example at the moment. Against this background, I personally really welcome the debate around regulation as timely and extremely important. In general, I find that the system of co-regulation is one that, will, that has a large number of benefits. And this sector has basically, generally, served the sector well and will continue to do so even with the changes of composition providers. But that doesn't mean that the system shouldn't change. But I'd like to suggest it does so according to a set of key principles. The starting point of these would be that intelligent regulation is aimed at enabling. An innovative provider looking for new ways to cross-subsidise social housing activities or indeed to assist the well-publicised squeeze middle needs a regulator that will encourage new programmes, products and ideas which are both proportionate and sensible. So this should be guiding principle one. Regulation should not stand in the way of innovation per se, but should ideally enable or certainly accommodate new models which manage risk, and that's the most important thing, manage risk both professionally and effectively. Most organisations in the sector have regular, relatively simple business models. We're not talking about complex, multifaceted businesses or high-risk city trading here. So it should be relatively easy to bring in the flexibility necessary to improve efficiencies and to find and use new funding opportunities. This flexibility needs to be reflected both in the regulation and equally importantly in the way that providers are able to work with the HCA and the GLA on the ground because all this is about providing homes that are desperately needed. So, guiding principle two, Flexibility must be built into the system to ensure that opportunities for improvement, expansion and cross-subsidy, which are, as I mentioned before, sensible and proportionate, are encouraged. Boards clearly have a, co a pivotal role to play in co-regulation. And their, their aim, in my view, is to satisfy the regulator that the sector is made up of well-managed providers who are able to assess and manage risks professionally and effectively in the process of providing homes. The role of the board is vital, clearly, to any system of co-regulation, but the scope to make wards, in my view, even more accountable for scrutinising risk. And I'm sure that everybody from the sector here will probably know that boards can be extremely difficult and ask a lot of questions, but actually, at the end of the day, they're a fantastic sounding board. A good board will understand the strengths and weaknesses of the individual provider. And I think this is very important here because providers are so different. So the, the strengths and weaknesses of the individual providers, the executive's ability to understand and manage the risks that they want to take, 
And most importantly, they'll also be seeing plenty of detailed information on a very regular basis, which enables them to judge performance, but also to act swiftly if things start to go wrong. So therefore, guiding principle three, the board must hold the preeminent responsibility for scrutinizing risks associated with the different business decisions and ventures. That doesn't mean that the regulator won't be involved as well, but the first port of call for all those things must be the board. So on to the pro proposals for ring fencing, which, I, which Stuart has already mentioned, and I'm sure we speak for the majority of housing associations in saying that we are worried about these, and we don't necessarily believe that their most effective way to achieve the aim of protecting social housing assets. It would almost certainly lead to difficulties in securing finance for non-core activities and in turn limit the cross-subsidy available, ultimately reducing the supply of housing at a time when we desperately need more homes. Ring fencing is potentially costly, really difficult to define, implement and police. And based on the discussions we've had with partners, lenders, other providers, the group most in favour of ring fencing appear to be the banks, apart from the regulator. And as an ex-banker, I can assure you that there are a number of other methods that banks can use to protect themselves through deal structures, through covenants, uh, I mean, otherwise, why a loan agreement so long? In summary, um, I would support a system of regulation based on flexibility and trying to get away from the one size fits all enabling providers to deliver more homes, continue to rehabilitate existing stock, and to support residents. Robust risk management is absolutely vital in this, but much of this is already being done at executive and board level. And we would like the regulatory balance to, to shift towards a, a system that effectively supports housing supply through sound and effective management, rather than one which is unduly restrictive. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I had a bit of an epiphany while Nick Hurd was speaking. I realised that he is my cosmic twin. I am the yang to his yin. And the reason for that is that he said that he never thinks about the law. Well, that's all I think about. <laughs> um, I am a lawyer. I dressed in the appropriate colour so you could identify me because I didn't get a name badge, apparently. Um, and it was fantastically encouraging to hear about all the potentials for the ways that you can diversify your activities and grow your communities. Uh, and you know, I was I was encouraged to hear it, but my heart also sank because it's hard enough for you to diversify beyond the activities that you do at the moment within your current structures as registered providers and as charities. Um, let alone if we're facing some of the regulatory challenges that we anticipate and I do appreciate that Matthew has tried to allay some of those concerns today. All paths lead to the regulator as far as I'm concerned because the regulator not only controls from a regulatory perspective what registered providers can do but it also controls through the back door what they can do as charities and what they can do within the constraints of their funding arrangements. Uh, and the reason for this is because there will be a statement somewhere, probably in your charitable objects, saying that you will do, you can do whatever the reg regulator allows a registered provider to do. And there will be a statement within your funding document saying you may only use the borrowing that you've taken out for purposes that are permitted by the regulator from time to time. So, frankly, we've come up with a number of very weird group structures as lawyers to enable our client registered providers to do what they want to do already. And in doing that, we have to comply with the regulatory framework. We have to comply with the Charity Commission's requirements and charity law for registered providers that are charities, and to be honest, most of you are now. We have to comply with procurement law, which um, kind of crept up by stealth on everybody, but now you basically can't do anything from a group structure perspective or starting new activities without thinking about whether there is a procurement angle. And every now and then, as lawyers, we get to a point where we think, ah, we've solved it all, we've found a way for you to do it, and it's fine. And then something comes out of the blue, uh, or the funders decide to plug a gap or a loophole that we found uh, and it really takes you back to square one. So from my perspective, the conversation that I would like to have with the regulator as they look at the way that you're going to be structured as registered providers going forward is actually how on earth are you going to come up with a structure 
that enables you to regulate what you feel needs to be regulated while still being permissive enough to let registered providers carry on doing what they think they need to do best. And let's be fair, registered providers know their communities much better than I can as a lawyer or the regulator can as an overarching regulator for the entire sector. I think we all understand the regulator's desire to protect the social housing assets. But the risks are that you actually then close the door on registered providers doing what they want to do. And there are a number of models coming up which mean that registered providers could perhaps stop doing some of the activities that they're currently carrying out. Uh, and where they've got restrictions on their group structure from their funding documents on forming subsidiaries and funding subsidiaries and transferring assets to subsidiaries, we can usually find workarounds for these. And the Minister talked about this Community First Grant Scheme uh, and community organisations being the focus for this. Frankly, good as they are, these things are all embryonic and if you had to stop doing a large chunk of what you're doing tomorrow or on the 1st of April next year, they would not be in a fit state to step into the breach that would then be caused. It's true that there are definitely encouraging possibilities for interfacing more with the private sector. Uh, so through the Social Value Act, you can uh, take forward procurement opportunities uh, in order to reward local businesses that deliver benefits to your communities. And HMRC is at the moment consulting on potentially giving significant tax breaks to private individuals who want to invest in social enterprises, all of which is very encouraging. But again, we are some way off seeing those as a pipeline of structures that you could use immediately to deliver activities beyond simply the current regulated activities and the community-focused activities. And if we look at the way that those kind of activities are delivered in the future, particularly commercial activities, in order to attract external investment, those have to be delivered in a way that is organised and within a supportive structure so that the investors know that they're going to get the return that they want and that their money is going to be used and managed appropriately. Housing associations do go a long way towards providing the comfort that investors need. The problem that we face is, if registered providers are restricted as to what they can do, both directly and within their group structures, and how they can set up organisations to deliver diversified activities, this is going to impact on the availability of private funding, not just for themselves in relation to their own activities, but in relation to organisations they may want to incubate and support. So all paths lead back to register providers as community catalysts and safe havens, drawing on your infrastructure, your local presence and your government <coughs> strengths. Any changes that the regulator makes to the definition of regulated activities could have a number of unintended consequences, because even if the regulator allows you to carry on non-regulated activities, if the general environment is that the regulator doesn't want you carrying out those activities, then the way that your funding documents and your charity projects are worded may make it very challenging for you to do that in the future. The message that I would like to give to the regulator is, speaking as a lawyer and speaking as somebody who day in, day out, has to throw buckets of cold water over the aspirations of a number of our registered provider clients. Please don't make my job any harder than it needs to be. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to have a go at sort of taking you back a few years and talking about our view of the market in the round, and then I'll, I'll dare say I'll get to some of the issues Elizabeth raised. So if we go back to the, the pre credit crunch era. Basically, the market that uh, I'm responsible for regulating is probably the most uh, successful private-public partnership, uh, certainly in this country, possibly in Western Europe. And it had a few features that made it successful. Firstly, uh, the ability to track private finance at very low margins. Secondly, the fact that housing benefit basically underwrote uh, the income of providers, uh, which made those providers that much more attractive, including to lenders. Thirdly, the indexation of rents, so that rents kept pace with costs or maybe outstripped underlying costs. Fourthly, the fact that government put in grant but it was subordinate to private finance and that grant perhaps covered 50% or so of the cost of the new home. And there was cross-subsidy from planning gain and a programme of tra uh, stock transfer from local authorities, typically with some sort of gap funding where it was necessary that allowed the sector to grow uh, rather fast over the period post the, uh, the changes in private finance in 1988. So overall, a model that started um, from reasonably humble origins but grew to a sector that's got now two and a half million homes on its balance sheet. Um, and that was fine until the credit crunch, but things have changed. Um, the firstly, and the most obvious point is that the fiscal context has changed dramatically and I think has changed for the foreseeable future. And you can see that permeating 
the way this market is operating and government policy. So whether it's the shift from social rent to affordable rent, some of the changes in, in terms of fixed term tenancies rather than lifetime tenancies, the changes in homelessness legislation, um, certainly the changes in welfare, which are about pairing back the state support uh, for those that, that receive welfare payments, but obviously have a knock-on effect on landlords. And frankly, I don't think that change is going to go away. And some issues around the corner around exactly what the role is of this sector in, in new supply, where local services are being reduced owing to fiscal constraints, what is the role of the housing association sector uh, in finding solutions, which you know, I think you were talking about earlier. Um, for, that, for, the, for the population, the generation that has not got access to home ownership, what's the role of housing associations in dealing with that? What appears to be a generation that's priced out of the market. The issues of fuel poverty and carbon emissions have not gone away. So there, there are challenges now, there are challenges in the future, and the fiscal context is unlikely to change. And that's changed the model, really. So without going into too much detail, private finance is shorter term, certainly if it comes from from bank lenders, usually at higher margins. At the moment, the costs are reasonable because interest rates are so low. Query where we'll be in five years' time. Housing benefit has obviously changed and some, it creates some risk for providers. Uh, we now have a, a rent settlement that's slightly different to the rent settlement before, but it's helpful, although probably worth a little less to the sector than the RPI settlement that we have now. And, you know, the big changes in grant which I've trailed. So we've, we've moved from one model to, frankly, quite a different model going forward. And it's very important from our perspective that we as the regulator and providers reflect on that and understand that the risk profile of this sector is changing and will continue to change. I think that's driven diversification in two or three respects. Um, firstly, I think a lot of providers are looking to innovate around their core social housing function or within their charitable virus, and most of you will be charities, whether that's doing more work with communities, whether it's looking at the intermediate market in a different way, uh, whether it's looking at using existing assets in a different way, perhaps disposing of those that don't perform well to reinvest. A range of things going on there. Um, it's certainly not the job of the regulator to stifle innovation in that respect. Um, it is our job, as I'll come on to, to, to worry about the risk. And secondly, and the thing that really has driven um, the discussion document, which Elizabeth referred to, is diversification away from core business um, and into what one might describe as, as commercial activities. Um, now, from a regulatory perspective, I think there's two sort of fundamental points I need to make. Firstly, our interest is in social housing. We're the social housing regulator. The statute gives us powers and respect and objects in respect of social housing. It, it does not give us the tools we might need to look at all aspects of private businesses and frankly I don't think we need to or should, should want to do that. So our interest in terms of the diversification debate is basically in protecting social housing assets for three reasons. Firstly, the, the we need to protect the tenants both in line with our statutory objects and because frankly you know, we're talking about a potentially vulnerable client group. We had some experience in the Cosmopolitan case of modelling what might happen if lenders enforce their security it creates all sorts of issues for some very vulnerable people. So uh, we are determined from that perspective to protect the assets. We have a responsibility to taxpayers who've put in over £40 billion worth of grant and other forms of subsidy as well. And some of that will be lost in the event of a provider failure. And last but not least, this sector will need to attract something <coughs> in the region of £15 to £20 billion to pay for the new affordable homes programme and it has a hump of refinancing in two or three years' time. The people who will provide that money will want a stable environment and confidence that they'll get it back uh, with interest. Um, so against that backdrop, what do we want to see? I think the thing that's driven the discussion document, certainly for the traditional sector, is a concept around recourse to the assets. And it certainly wasn't our intention to say that uh, you couldn't get into commercial or non-social housing activity and expose the assets to some kind of risk, the question is whether that risk was manageable in all foreseeable circumstances. So whatever we do on ring fencing, and we've, we're absorbing the feedback, and I think we, we knew that were going to be difficulties because you really wouldn't start from a sector this diverse and structured in this way. There needs to be some way for boards to understand, firstly, the level of recourse to the assets in, in different circumstances, and secondly, to provide us 
with assurance that that level of recourse is manageable, such that the assets are not put at risk. Secondly, from a more sort of practical perspective, if people are doing commercial things, they need commercial skills and commercial disciplines. That probably means different staff, it may mean different board structures, it will certainly mean an understanding of the, the business you're getting into, such that you manage it effectively. It means appropriate pricing of risk, and frankly we do see providers not drifting into new activities, but getting involved in activities that in the private sector are deemed to be sufficiently risky to warrant a 10, 11, 12 percent return, and looking at 3, 4, 5 percent returns on that activity. Two problems with that, one is that if you misprice risk, you end up with a, an organisation that's structured in quite a delicate and fragile way over time. And secondly, that probably isn't in keeping with charitable inquiries, and as most of you are charitable, you should be thinking about those issues from an investment perspective. Um, now, it's not easy for my regulators to go out and, and judge whether boards uh, and executives have got a handle on those risks. We need, we need to think about both what the framework says and how we develop our staff cadre and our operational approach to do that. But I think the message I'd like to give you is, is firstly that we are taking the protection of the assets extremely seriously and that isn't going away. Secondly, that we've listened to the, the response we've got from the discussion document, some of which I think was based on a slightly false premise about what we were trying to achieve, but some of it was highlighting some important practical concerns. And thirdly, whatever we do, we will think about both our policy approach, so what's in the standards, and our operational approach hand in hand, and we'll want to engage you in the sector in doing that over the coming months. Afternoon, everybody. Um, let me apologise in advance if I offend. I'm not an expert on this regulation stuff, and I come at this from a, from a resident's point of view, the young people's point of view. Um, we are only interested in the regulation as far as it increases supply. You could have no co conversation about ha housing and public housing in this country unless you're talking about supply. That's all your residents are interested in. I work for probably several, eight different groups that touch about 17 to 800 individuals, 1700 individuals. I think probably 90% of us live in some form of public housing. I do myself. And all we're concerned in is what your regulations do to the supply that we all get hold of. Because obviously the big issue now is where we're going to live. When we speak to young people in particular, they are concerned that they live in environments where they have no understanding of the regulation. They have no sight of it and then they then form conspiracy theories that you're doing things with public money that don't entirely benefit them. I say that to you because as these changes come in, it's a great opportunity to clue your residents up into what your social mission is, what the regulation um, boundaries are like for you and why you do things in particular ways. The last two estates I've, li I've lived on, when those estates have been come around to be renewed, it started quite interesting conversation in, in why the Housing Authority was doing that and why they didn't do something else. And the residents weren't aware of what is illegal for a housing association to do. And that led to um, a lot of wasted time with consultancy. And I think one of the problems for residents is your charitable status and then your desire to have um, commercial activities. I personally think that's a great thing. I think anything that gets more money into, the, into this arena is useful. But you are viewed as charities and residents um, view charities in a very particular way. I actually think, and I, I don't mean to offend, but I actually think many of your non-core activities, so you know, not providing housing and maintenance around charity work is wrong. You need to figure out who you are. And I think the change of regulation is another point you could address that. Because if you're an 18-year-old boy who lives on my estate, I'm not sure if you're the police or you're my housing association. I'm not sure if I get a, an antisocial behaviour award somewhere else, do you put me out? And that's a big concern for me. I really desperately believe that you should not be our all and regulation should prevent you from being everything in our lives. That effectively makes us, it, it effectively makes you sort of Victorian, I don't know, philanthropist. You, you, you get to decide about all of our lives and that's wound in the regulation and the fact that you're also charities and you deliver things in our lives outside of that. I know many housing associations do very strong things for the benefit of their residents around the wider piece and why they may be living with deprivation. But I, I really personally think it's something that needs to be looked at in the regulation. How far, how much influence do you have over my life? What, what, are, what are your activities? 
Um, I bring that up as well because I wonder how many residents you have on your board. And I wonder how many of your residents have any real power. And I ask the question, could they? If you, if you magic up tomorrow and said, okay, we'll have you in here, do your residents actually have the wherewithal to, 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 to do that function? And there's a care piece for you in there. You may have to seek, you, may, you need to build a uh, mechanism that supports your residents enough to take these positions up. Because oftentimes residents have a very different take to the professionals who very, very rarely <clears throat> live anywhere near the housing provision that they're providing. Where I live, um, a lot of our residents wanted our housing association to build streets and houses, not estates. And that conversation was, um, was hard to have, again, because the residents don't understand <coughs> the revenue framework in which you work in. I understand that you can't give it all over because it's very complicated, hence lawyers and people who control revenue bodies. But I, as a resident, you feel very disempowered. There's nothing to keep you feeling um, poor more than not understanding what's going on around you, having absolutely no stake in it. You cannot have a stake in the people who provide your housing if you don't understand the environment that they have to operate in as well. And as a, as a housing provider, you're going to figure out how much of that information you give over when, where and how. I think there's a real care piece there. Um, I, I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll end on this. It, it's more of a plea from residents because we see you in many respects as our way of, of entering the political fray and, and, the, and the regulatory fray and, and we would hope that you campaign for some of the things that we, we need to understand. I speak to my, my lot a lot about housing and the major things they're interested in is planning. I'll give you an example. Most of the young people I work with can't understand why Battersea Power Station still stands. They think it should be knocked down and we build entire neighbourhoods. They think it's a complete waste of time. And that they, their housing, the people who house us, don't have these broader conversations. That understand that. A lot of the people I live with feel that you should be providing them with houses that they can own. Now, I don't even know how possible that is for you. But that is definitely how they feel. We're in an environment now where everybody talks about home ownership not being right for everyone. But make no mistake, 99% of British people want home ownership. They see it as some kind of um, golden fleece. And you need to have the wider conversation with the regulation in the background of why you do or don't provide that. Because you are not just the people who give us bricks and mortar. You represent us in a very powerful professional way if you want to. Thank you. Okay, Sean, thank you very much for that. Um, conscious we're getting close to lunch now, we've got about 10, 10 minutes or so for, for questions. So any questions from the floor for our speakers? Anybody keen? Uh, Philip, see, I've got one I want to ask before that, if that's okay, Philip. But uh, I'm, just, I'm just interested, I mean, maybe what we could do actually, we could maybe get a quick show of hands from the audience, if that's okay. Uh, I'm just interested in, in um, you know, obviously, a number of you here know work for, for, for social landlords, so we'll have a sense of you know, the background to what's been talked about in terms of the, the regulatory environment. Hopefully those of you who are not will have got enough of a sense from the presentations, at least to get a, a grip of you know, what, what the debate is. But I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of um, you know, what, what's been proposed to introduce ring fence to try to of ensure that the risks are being uh, you know, mitigated around uh, what, what housing associations do to try to diversify their businesses, to try to pick up that role that's been talked about of you know, supporting communities. I mean, do, to what extent people think that that is the, the, the right sort of way to be going? The show of hands of those people who think, yes, it sounds like the right, ring fencing sounds like the right way to go to, to secure the, the social, social homes. People think that's a good idea? Nobody thinks it's a good idea. I do. <laughs> okay. Do people think there's a better idea to rely on boards to, to sort of to determine what happens in their organisations? Okay, slightly more support for that. Okay, all right. Um, I think um, I mean maybe maybe Matthew, one thing for you actually. When I come to you first. I'll come to you in a second. That's okay. But I'm just wondering the um, I mean. What Elizabeth said there seems to be checking with this audience anyway, in the sense that you know um, housing associations feel that they prefer a more flexible approach to what they're what they're doing to try to to uh, to encourage them, facilitate the construction of more homes, facilitate them generating more income. I mean, to, to what extent do you sort of? I mean, you said in your presentation you're, you're open to trying to work with people on, on the responses they've given you, which is great. I'm sure Elizabeth will welcome that other show too. But just wondering, to what extent do you see yourself? and the HCA delivering that more flexible approach that was talked about. Just a quick one, actually. Uh, 
Um, well, we're actually discussing this at a committee meeting on Thursday, so I don't want to preempt that discussion, but um, I, a couple of points about what we're trying to do here. What we're not trying to do is stop people doing things. Um, it's not within our locus to do so, nor is it the intention of the committee. I mean, depending on how you look at it, ring fencing can either be something that's deemed to be very restrictive or something that allows you to get on with doing all the other things you're doing, just in a way that doesn't uh, create risk for the social housing system. And I guess we think of it in the, in the session way. Right? Now, whether ring fencing, as described in the discussion group number one, as understood in the discussion group number one, ends up being the answer or even part of the answer, I think we're thinking about that hard. But if you're going to build lots more social homes in a, in a new market that is riskier and attract the, the debt that's needed to do that, housing associations need to show a way that they are and I've got a risk profile that's still attractive to lenders uh, who are often in capacity rates. Lately, more and more uh, risk onto the same set of assets that eventually will become a problem in that respect. And you know, we got quite close with the bottom bottom days. Had, it, had there been an insolvency, had the lenders enforced their security, I can promise you that all the rest of you are probably managing risks perfectly well. We would have found it harder to attract the finance you need the competitive rate. So we are actually trying to support supply and innovation, but in a way that if you like, doesn't um, kill the chicken and make it all there. And it is a very difficult balance, a very difficult balance, but I don't think it's a straight, you know, a straight tension between supply and innovation on the one hand and the regulation on the other. If regulation goes wrong and people get into trouble, eventually that will affect supply and innovation uh, in a way that you really don't want. Uh, I'm going to question. Any more questions in the, in the audience? Any hands? If there's a gentleman there as well, okay, we can take further than the gentleman over there if that's okay. Thank you. Um, th thanks very much. Uh, I, was, I was really struck by um, the regulator's presentation and then, and then Victoria's and about how roads lead to the regulator and people are essentially regulated out of innovation, which has caused a terrible problem. Um, we, we as public, uh, we're, we're quite involved with the Social Value Act, which, which is, you know, is the services, not works contracts. So, so one of the things that strikes me, Matthew, hearing your presentation, then hearing the presentation from uh, the Minister for Civil Society this morning, is it doesn't appear to me that you have within your regulatory armory, if you will, a way of saying social value helps protect the asset. Because if you just if you just think of the amount of building that social uh, housing does, or the amount of properties it occurs for, if it creates social value, it massively increases the property values of those areas. But all the attempts that people here are trying to do, and the wish I think of many in this room, is to move the the uh, the agenda on from simply a build agenda to also a radical care and social growth agenda. What, would, what do you need, and it can be hypothetical here, what, do, what would you need as a regulator uh, to enable you to actually grow that, to actually genuinely create an environment which you could recognise that innovation and broker that innovation? Gentlemen over there as well. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've got time Sorry. Hi, I'm Paul Doe from Shepherds Bush Housing Group. I just want to take issue with Sean on the issue about what tenants want. I don't think it's true to say that all tenants want is more supply. A third of my board are tenants, and what they will say is, our rent increases are going towards providing more housing that we cannot get our hands on. Because all that housing is going to local authorities to meet their housing needs. There are many tenants around, and this is an educational issue for us all, who would love to pull up the drawbridge and see us using all of our resources for existing tenants and not for new ones. I just make that point. That was as good as good as good. Matthew, we'll come to you first if that's okay. And then Sean, any more questions, please stick your hands up. Um, well, I, I think the major contribution regulation could make is, is not putting in barriers, actually. I don't think we're going to broker uh, you know, the kind of diversification or the kind of you know, value creation that you're talking about. Essentially, it's a, it's a local issue uh, more than anything else, and, and a regulator trying to dabble in local issues in that way, I think, would get itself unstuck. 
in terms of the consumer side of our business, which at least is tangentially related, we've stepped right back from regulating consumer standards anyway. So I don't think we're we're not proactively monitoring them. They're not they're not in the way. I think for doing anything. I do recognise the point that, and you can see it in some, certainly in some sort of major regeneration schemes, that it's possible for creation of social value and financial value to go hand in hand. So I remember Carol Matthews and Co in Riverside walking me around an area there where effectively Riverside is, is underwriting the Kensington area of Liverpool to a significant extent, putting in uh, a range of interventions, some social, some you know, about property, and over time, the aim is to, is to make that area work in a different way. I think that's an entirely good thing. I would hate for the regulators to get in the way. Our bottom line is, are you doing that in a way that's consistent with your ongoing solvency? If you are, and you're managing the risks around it, I don't see a problem with that. And, and I would be very worried if we were getting in the way. I, and I don't think we're prescribing, proscribing, you know, you can, thou shalt not do X. Our bottom line is a principle that says, if you're going to do it, manage the risk and make sure you're around in five, ten years' time, because the assets you're, you know, you've got a stewardship role on are important, um, not just for you, but for the social housing market in general. Um, I will come to the two of you in the panel. I'm conscious that we've not <laughs> got to the two of you yet, but what's we'll show on then? There's no more questions. I've got a couple I want to pick up on that will bring the two of you in. Don't worry, sorry. Sure. Yeah, um, how I would reply to that, you'll find that's residents who already have a home, that the point being, um, most of the people I deal with are either parents and are looking to the fact where they're going to put their children or either young people who are not, who currently are not being housed and that problem is not going away. Um, I agree with you that if, if you said to people, and this is my point about the education piece, people don't understand where your extra supply goes. You know, I, I used to live on a Sutton estate and there used to be an idea that, you know, they just build and move your kids in. They didn't realise that council was in that in that conversation and that's why I say that for for you as a group, a professional group, you need to help us understand a little bit more what's going on for you. Because I tell you something now, I, the, the one thing I'm not expert in this in this regulatory framework, but I know the politics. And I tell you something now, if you're a local MP and a, and a, a group of people rock up and start saying about housing, you just support them because it makes you look good. And and if you if it's the wrong thing for the house for, for the local housing situation, that won't stop the MP. That will not stop the MP, and as I said, and, and one thing again, I want to say I'm not an expert, but when you say a free regulatory form, so boards can innovate and stuff, the, the conservative me wants to support that, but the person who's nervous about losing their home. So if I'm a resident, it sounds like you're going to be like the bankers. You're going to go wild. You're not ring fenced, and I'll be copying the bill. Now that might not be true, but I don't know. So if you want support in that politically, you need to help that people understand what are the consequences. What would have happened? What happens if Genesis? I live in Genesis property. What happens if, if, if they go pop tomorrow morning? What does it mean for me as a resident? Does it mean me and my kids are on the street? That changes my ability to support you or not. Sure, thank you for that. I mean, I'd love to get into that more. I'm conscious of time, so I do apologise. One thing I wanted to pick up, and then we'll bring Elizabeth, Elizabeth and Victoria in just quickly. Um, and it does strike me, and regardless of you made your plea, obviously, in your presentation, Victoria, about trying not to sort of shake it up again. It's going to kind of make the, you know mean that you know there's a hiatus in terms of innovation. But I think um, you know it does strike me that I mean you know whatever the HCA does end up doing in terms of the framework, you know, um, you know, people, clever lawyers will find ways of making things happen. Uh, I still, I still that we've seen that in the past. That will still be the case. I'm, I'm, I'm sure of it. Um, but I think one thing I do want to pick up on, which is placed the wider kind of point of the whole event today, which is you know the, the, the extent to which um, the people, um, you, you both feel that social landlords actually, and the clients that you see, obviously your your experience of your own organisation, Elizabeth. But you know the extent to which people actually have the entrepreneurial flair and ability to actually get involved and and sort of you know see the opportunities that are there. I mean, and sort of how far should um, should housing associations be going really? Are we talking? We've heard before we should be looking at getting involved in schools, some already are, which is I think is a really interesting development. But should we be looking further than that? Public transport? Should we be looking at um, I don't know, and obviously social care is in there. We're looking at supermarkets, things that kind of underpin communities. But how far should 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 we be going? Really, I think is the uh, is the thing. Elizabeth, I'll come to to you first. Well, I think. Um Good, good organisations always want to get involved in a wide range of things, but um, I would say from a, from a housing association's point of view, we are a social business and where we want to expand 
is, is at the edges of what we do already. Um, and, and that doesn't mean that we're not interested in social value, but it means, um, and I'm sure most people in the room who work for Housing Association, the amount of money that we are now putting into supporting residents and into wider activities is of a completely different scale to the things that we've done before. Um, where we talk about uh, making investment, we're talking about making investment in new homes because we understand that. Um, I think from the regulator's point of view, I'd be very, uh, you know, I'm sympathetic to the fact that if housing associations start really expanding into things that they haven't got the experience in before, we could end up with a lot of people in very difficult situations. So what, when I was talking before about expansion and about innovation, I was talking about it being measured and proportionate to the main business of a housing association. It'd be nice to think we could do everything, but in practice I don't think we can. Thanks. Um, from my perspective, I get asked to advise on um, housing associations doing stuff which falls broadly within their objects, which isn't housing. Uh, and those are charities are already subject to a requirement that actually anything that you do must satisfy the public benefit test. So if there is a private benefit, there must be an equal or ex exceeding public benefit. But the problem is all of that good stuff costs money and there is very little money around, so organisations have to be able to subsidise from somewhere. Uh, and if they're not going to be able to use borrowed funds, then they need to look at commercialising some of their activities. And in that respect, a number of organisations um, are hidebound to outdated governance arrangements which can't be changed. Not all organisations, and many organisations have moved beyond um, restrictions in their, the way that a board's appointed, for example, so that boards are appointed straight by nomination rights rather than based on skills and experience. But for other organisations, it's very, very challenging for them to move beyond this because they need to get, for example, local authority support and they need to carry shareholders and that's very difficult for them. I think it would be very helpful for the regulator to think about what it can do to support those organisations so they have the capacity amongst their board members to deliver diversified activities in a way that manages risks appropriately because there are some organisations out there where the board I don't think is necessarily capable of doing that and the organisation really does need a hand. Thank you both for that. Uh, I'm just conscious of time and there's, there's more things I'd love to get into but um, I think it's time for lunch and everyone to take a well-earned break. So if you can thank the panel, usually. Thank you very much.